from Unity Church of Christianity in Houston, Texas. This is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational Christian church providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress with the Rev. Howard Caesar. So there's a grandfather that tells about an experience he had with his son and grandson. They're all in the car. They're coming back from a Cub Scout meeting uh, that they all went to. And uh, the grandfather observes his grandson asking his son, Dad, I know babies come from mommy's tummies, but how do they get there in the first place? So the grandfather is watching his son answer this question for his grandson. And uh, after his son hems and haws a while, his grandson finally spoke up with a little disgust in his voice and said, you don't have to make something up, Dad. It's OK if you don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's true that children know we, we don't have the answer to everything. And it's true there are a lot of things that we don't know. Some we have the answer to, and we couch it around various terms, and some things we don't know. You know, do we really know what a thing is, whatever the thing is we might point to in our life or in our world? I think we only really know something to the extent that our mind will allow us. You know, our mind puts various restrictions and barriers on things as we describe them, as we look at them. And, uh, you know, most all of you are wearing a watch. And uh, do you really know what a watch is? You know, oh, we can say it's a gadget that, you know, tells the time, gives me the time all day long. And, uh, and uh, wear it on my wrist. And some have wrist watches that give all kinds more information and things like that, so they vary. But do we really know? Do we really know the intricacies of a watch, how it operates, what it really is? Do we really understand it uh, beyond our field of sight? You know, in a sense, we can look at our watch, and to me, it's a mystery. I don't know how that thing keeps ticking. And every day, my second hand is at the same place that your second hand is in terms of not missing a second. We're all attuned. How does that something inside there get that all right? You know, there's a lot of things that are a mystery to me around that. And so we all have a concept of a watch and what it is, and that may vary one person to the next. You may describe it one way, I may describe it another. And so, you know, but beyond our concept, beyond each of it, there's sort of a mystery. You know, we've all experienced a beautiful sunset that has sort of taken our breath away. And it's just a sunset that maybe in a moment has just touched us very deeply. And uh, it can take us to a place and to an experience that is beyond the senses, beyond um, what it is we have just seen. We're, we're beyond the sight actually. And there's a saying that the Upanishads have uh, where they state, when before the beauty of a sunset or a mountain, you pause and exclaim, ah, you are participating in divinity. Beautiful, isn't it? Anytime you are pausing to see a sight, a mountain, a sunset, and you pause to just go, ah, in that moment, you're beyond it, you know, and you're into participating in divinity. It's a moment in which a person has just the realization of the, the beauty and the wonder that lies beyond what it is that one is viewing. There's something larger that exists there, and you sense it, and it's sort of sacred and holy, and you gasp, and you can't even put words around it because to put words around it would be to limit it. So do we really know what a sunset is? Oh, we can say, yeah, that's when, you know, there's a sun <laughs> in the sky and it's dropping 
and there may be clouds around it, and it's, there's colors, and, and the earth is moving, and, and so, you know, it begins to fade away, and you, we, we know that much. We can, you know, we can read or listen to scientists and physicists as to what their take on it and how they describe it, but it basically is an experience that we receive that takes us beyond and can take us beyond. And so we somehow transcend the facts of what we have learned about a sunset, what we know about a sunset. We transcend all of that uh, to simply enter into an experience that goes beyond it. It's a feeling of something that's hard to describe. And so that takes us to really the question, well, do we really know God? You know, do we really know God? We all have a concept of God, and we have a concept that is growing in us, and even a, a concept that we grew up with from the time that we were a child. You know, there, we may have started out with the idea that, of course, is often referred to as the anthropomorphic God, the God that's standing off in the sky with the white beard and the long white robe, and it's distant from us, and, and that he, you know, doesn't always have a pleasant temperament. And... Um, that it's a God that can sometimes withhold love, sometimes is punishing, sometimes can be angry, that it's a separate God. He's there, we're here. That's not what we teach, but that's where we may have started in our childhood, uh, and many a child has. And so obviously we teach here that love is, God is love now, always, forever. We teach that God does not punish, that essentially we punish ourselves or go through things by virtue of being out of harmony with the universal laws and principles. And we teach that we are not separate from God, but God is all around us and within us. But whatever our concept, whatever our concept or understanding of God is, that will be our experience. We're not going to go beyond that concept and that understanding um, in an experience. Our concepts, therefore, if limiting, can become the barriers to a richer and fuller experience of who and what God is. And so it's the idea that is stated, according to your belief, so it be done unto you. According to your belief in your concept of God, so will be your God to you. That basically we hold God within those boundaries and the barriers of the concept, if they're small and limiting in particular. So we must then become or be transcendent. That's what we're talking about in terms of being transcendent beings, stepping into the transcendent domain, if you will. It's an interesting word, but it basically means that which is beyond all concept, beyond words that could ever possibly be des described. It's, it's an experience, and everything falls short of it. You have to be there. You have to have been there. You have to have experienced it. It's the only way. I can't give you God. Okay? You have to experience God. You have to get there. Okay? And so we enclose oftentimes God in our concepts in the way that we try to think of God. You know, we have to be willing to transcend all of the old concepts that we may have grown up with or that still are residue that we're carrying with us forward. Oftentimes, you know, we go, oh, God, please. You know, we look up like God is up. Oh, God is our right, our left, up, down, in, in. God's everywhere. You know, but the concept, and I don't make that wrong by any means, but it's just something to note uh, of what a tendency is. You know, one man, when he was a little boy, he was uh, being brought up in his particular church, his particular denomination, and he was told or taught there that he had a guardian angel on his right shoulder at all times, and that he had a tempting devil on his left side, left shoulder, and that he was told that all the decisions that he would be making in his life would depend on whether the devil or the angel had the greater influence on him at the time. And he said that those beliefs became solid in him. You know, they, they became real, like factual for him, that there was really an angel and a devil with him all the time. And uh, until eventually, later, he learned to think of it as think of them as metaphors, really, he said, for the impulses that moved in him, the impulses that guided him. Even our words, you know, the words that we use can be such a limitation to our God. They're just a word. Until you get into the experience, they're, they're nothing, you see. 
So an important point to remember or to realize is that one has to be willing to transcend one's concepts and ideas about God and be able to go beyond the horizon of one's own description, one's own way of formulating it, and go into the mystery. Go into the mystery. Because in the mystery, there's no concepts, there's no words, there's no description. There's the mystery. And to know that there is an element of, you see, the mind, the mind of us keeps us from God in so many ways because it wants to define it. It wants to explain it. It, it just wants to talk about it. And as soon as you do, that's as far as you can go into the experience and into the mystery. And so it's by having a profound sense of the mystery of God that we really open up to a profound experience of the divine. The psychologist Carl Jung, uh, he said something very interesting. He said, religion is a defense against the experience of God. Whoa. A lot of people wouldn't want to hear that on Sunday morning. Religion is a defense against the experience of God. Now, he was not saying that religion was bad. He was saying that people are reluctant to push past the concepts that they've been given within the framework of a religion and a doctrine about God. He was saying that the mystery has been reduced to a set of concepts and ideas, and that these often ideas and concepts that we've been given can prevent a person from a transcendent experience of the mystery of God. That's what he was saying. And so many of the images that we hold become really an obstruction and a barrier that, that holds one back based on small thinking about God. It limits our spiritual growth because growth is about expanse. It's broadening our whole concept and idea of life, God, ourselves. So when a larger experience of God is made available in some modality, some capacity, one that is greater than the person is prepared in that moment to receive, they pull away, you know? They pull away from it clinging to the images, the concepts, the ideas that are familiar, you see, that are safe, that have already been lodged and conditioned in the mind. And it's almost a fight to preserve the status quo, the existing elements of a faith, rather than to open to the possibility of a greater experience. And so it's important to realize if you are doing what Jung really was talking about within the framework of your religion. Jesus had to fight this same tendency, of course, you know, with the people of his time. Those people who were clinging to an ideology uh, in their time, a way of thinking about God, thinking about themselves, their relationship. He was trying to bring forward a larger experience of God, you see, but he met up with the resistance of the people of that day, the religious, the religious establishment, most certainly. But he was about bringing in a broader sense of understanding of God as love, and that there was a, to be an opening of the heart, and that, that this was something that would be brought on by the Spirit. You know, and he was saying it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that takes you into the holiness of the divine. In the East, it would be spoken of as activating the kundalini, is similar to uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit. It's the energies of the divine that are activated and moving you, moving through you. Now, all of us go through various stages in our progression and unfoldment and awakening. We rise, uh, hopefully, gradually, eventually, into our more transcendent kind of experience because it's there. And so we move from elements of spiritual immaturity into spiritual maturity. We begin to make new choices. We, um, you know, we, we begin to, to look at uh, where we've been, what we've identified with, how we've identified ourselves, and begin to break through some of the barriers and limitations that we have held. We begin sometimes with what is crudely described as simply elementary. It's even been described as uh, animal-like in terms of the, 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 hung, the, the need for the hunger for things and the, the greed and, and that element that, that takes over a person at early stages. Then there is spoken of the, the carnal stage of the sexual zeal 
And that's where Freud's philosophy comes in, where he says, you know, many people are in, in that realm. And actually, in the East, they would say that's being stuck simply at the lower chakra levels, okay? But then there is the stage that you move into that is uh, physical mastery. And that means that essentially the things that uh, frighten you or are afraid of out there, the things that challenge you, the problems, the external things, that you basically begin to develop your willpower, the will to power your way through some of these and, and focus on the problems and the challenges and take physical mastery over them, and, and it's an overcoming time. But then somewhere between there, uh, you eventually, and there may be other steps that are left out here, but eventually there comes the stage where a person in their progression is touched by the heart. That's really what it comes to. You're touched by the heart. And there is something at a deep sense of level of compassion and connectedness that is awakened in a person. So there's an evolution. There's an evolution in consciousness in which a person moves through different stages as a species, really, as the human species. And we eventually come to realize that we and that other person and that all other people are basically creatures of the one same life, the one same intelligence, the one same source. And that awakening, when it really is experienced at a deep level, you know, takes you to uh, a more transcendent state. It's an opening of the heart, you know, to a world of all life. Um, it's almost as though it's one's own personal virgin birth, you see, because it's a birth of a new life that formerly had its elements in immaturity, elementary, physical aims, what have you. Not that physical aims are bad, it's just that it can't be out of balance. Somehow, at certain stages, that's all we're engulfed with. That's all we think about. That's all that's on our mind. And then at various places, we transcend that. And we think, no, there's more. There's more here, and there's a purpose to my life. And we begin to ask the right questions. When you ask some of the right questions, you get some of the right answers. And that's part of the progress. And so we've begun to move into states of transcending, transcending the ego and beginning to identify more and more with our own Christ nature, our, our God self, our spiritual, spiritual nature. You know, there are scriptures uh, that talk about this, uh, the process of stages to a degree and uh, the process of spiritual evolution and even the mystery. And uh, one passage that I found that is meaningful is where Paul is uh, speaking to the Corinthians. And it's found in the second and third chapter, really, of, of 1 Corinthians. And I want to read some of this to you and just gr grasp from it what he's saying to them and in w whether you can relate to, to it. He says, we speak, we speak of a message of wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age or world, not, nor the rulers of this age or world who are passing off the scene. Instead, he says, we speak about the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And then he says, but God has revealed them, those things, to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, he says, now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. He goes on to say, these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. He's talking about now the experience. It's not what man teaches in words, but what God teaches with an experience of the Spirit. 
He says, but the natural man, the you and me, the everyday man, woman, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We look at things that we, we don't understand, they don't fit our concept that we hold, and we say it's foolishness. Because we do not spiritually discern. But he says, but we have the mind of Christ. And he says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal people, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So what is he saying? He's saying you have to transcend certain stages where you have been in order to be not mere men and women, but really totally of the spirit and into the mystery of it. Wisdom is a bit of mystery, and there is wisdom in mystery. And in the things that we may not yet understand, the things that we cannot yet necessarily explain and put words around and shape, things are revealed through the experience of the spirit, the movement of the energies of the spirit, of the Holy Spirit. You know, not, not, not necessarily things of the world alone, not through words that are spoken to describe happenings, but only through the experience. Experience is so important. And to those who do not have the experience, the person over here may have the experience, the person over here does not have the experience, those who are not willing to enter into the mystery of things, it will appear as foolishness and even be labeled, perhaps, foolishness in their mind, because spiritual things need to be spiritually discerned. And at some stages, we are like babes in Christ, you know? We're not able to receive yet solid food, as Paul was talking. Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ, you know? Which is to say, we have, on some level, we have this mature mind that lives within us, that knows. It's not the mind of the separate, selfish self. It's not the mind of the ego. But it's that which we grow in consciousness to, which we transcend some of the old uh, in us. It's that which we allow and let this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. And so the ultimate goal for all of us, hopefully for all of us, you can claim, is to be united with our God. That's the ultimate goal, bottom line, you know, to be united with God. And that doesn't mean we have to die to be united with God. That's another concept that we've put on and limited ourselves. Oh, now there's a timeline. Let's see it. Got to wait till I die before I really am one with God. That's fallacy again, you know. And so the ultimate goal is oneness. And it is the experience of the ah, ah, that is behind the sunset. You know, it's to go past all the concepts. It's to dissolve that separate self and begin to identify all the more with a presence, a presence. And in the presence that you're taken into, it can be a mystery, you know. The essence of the Christian faith is that God was in Jesus Christ. Do you agree? That's the essence of the Christian faith. God was in Jesus Christ. That the very energies and the forces of the divine were there, which include love and peace and joy and oneness. They were in Jesus and certainly we don't argue with that. But the Gnostic teachings and Buddhist teachings and some of the other teachings that are out there say that God is also in you and in me. And for many, that is blasphemy, okay? Jesus realized and experienced that he and the Father were one. And then he became an example of what it looked like to live from that oneness and be an example. Now, Jesus' ministry was about going beyond the concept of one's self, you know. And he said, to paraphrase, he said, he who drinks from my mouth will become as I am. He who makes these truths, their experience, will become as I. Interesting. 
And it's interesting, too, that Jesus was accused of blasphemy. You know, you can read all about it in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, and it's the passage where Jesus says to the, the religious establishment that were gathered around him that he says that he and the Father are one. That's where it's quoted. And you know what they did? They picked up stones to stone him. And he says, well, wait a minute. Why, why do you wish to stone me? Why? And they all said, because you blaspheme. You are only a man, and you make yourself out to be a god. They couldn't go there. They held him where they thought of themselves to be, you see. And Jesus, what did he fire back? Jesus says, don't you remember that in your own scriptures, there's a place where it says, ye are gods? So Jesus put to them the idea that there's even in their scriptures that you need to think a little higher of yourself. That's what I'm here about. And we see that people all the time who are not ready to transcend their concept of themselves, you know. The Hindus have a saying. They say, none but a god can worship a god. None but a god can worship a god. And it's not talking about the god, you know. It's that which is beyond you, beyond ego, beyond the separate self. It's the deepest part of your being where there is the nature of the divine self that, that is holy and sacred in you. And it's there, you know. It's the awe behind the experience of the sunset. And so I want to say that there are awakened states that are existing here and now awaiting all of us. This is a unique time in the history of humanity. There's a lot of problems and change going on out there, but there's also the opportunity, like never before, to move into higher states, awakened states. And they are ways that are not familiar. There is mystery in them. We may not understand them. I've gone to John of God in Brazil, uh, and uh, Oprah has followed me there now. <laughs> and so, and uh, I can't understand what goes on, but there's something amazing, and it's the work of God, and healing is going on. I've gone to India four times and have experienced something called oneness, and it's an experience that I, I can't give it to you until you choose to go into it, but I, I believe in it, and it's sacred, and it's holy, and there's, there is, it, it accelerates being able to be taken into higher states. It moves things out of the way and uh, clears and cleans the mind and you become a conduit for God. And all I'm saying here is that we have to be able to be willing to rise in consciousness so, if we can, so that we can better make a difference in this world, to be part of the time to which we have been called and the doors that are opening to us in terms of op opportunities for awakening. And so reflect on the stage at which you are at and ask God to help guide you and empower you uh, to transcend wherever you may be to the next level to go. Be willing to experience the mystery of life and the mystery of God that lies beyond the mind's explanations and commentary. Something grand and great wants to be birthed in all of you. God bless. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. At Unity, we believe that God's presence of love and goodness is everywhere and that life is meant to be good. You can find out more about Unity and our teachings at unityhouston.org.